This is Real Analysis Lecture 30. We tried taping this morning in the ordinary room, but the camera stopped working for some unknown reason. But we're hoping the camera's going to work here later in the day, and I can go through Lecture 30 in front of an empty classroom except for our cameraman. We're reviewing for Exam 3. And as usual, I like to work backwards in reviewing for exams. And we're going to consider one main example and try to illustrate a lot of concepts, especially in Chapter 7, but some in Chapter 6 as well, with this one example. You can see it on the, on the screen there. It's f of x equals 3 over 4 plus 5x. And we're going to consider the Taylor series for this centered at 2, just to pick something different. We considered a similar example at the end of the last lecture. <clears throat> I want to show you, first of all, that you can algebraically try to figure out this Taylor series by considering this to be the sum of a geometric series. You want the r in the expression of a over 1 minus r to involve x minus 2 if you're going to center this series at 2. So one manipulation you can do is you can just replace the x with x minus 2. But of course, if you're going to get equality here, if you do that, you have to compensate. We're really subtracting 10, 5 times negative 2 is negative 10, so we really need to add 10 back in if we're going to do this. This can now be rewritten as 3 over 4 plus, or 14 plus 5 times x minus 2. Sorry about that. We also want a 1 there and a minus sign there. Factoring out the 14 and putting up it up top, and I get three 14s like that, gives you a 1 there. We can make the plus a minus sign if we, in parentheses, have a minus sign there. Since we factored the 14 out of the bottom, we have to do it out of the other term, too. We have a negative 5 times x minus 2 over 14. So that is now in the form a over 1 minus r, where a is 3 14s, and r is negative 5 times x minus 2 over 14. I will leave it to you to now write that out on your own based on this pattern. That it would equal this when the absolute value of r is less than 1. Zoom in on that if that's too small. Replace a with 3 14 so replace r with negative 5 times, well, negative 5 14 times x minus 2. Let's now check. The answer with Mathematica, come back to the screen here. So here's the function, 3 over 4 plus 5x. Using series in this way, putting the function right here, specifying the variable to be x, specifying the center of the Taylor series to be 2. We often put 0 there, but here we're putting a 2. And specifying that the highest degree term that we will see is the third degree term with the 3 there gives us this. Hopefully, if you try the exercise of computing this series by hand, based on this, and did some simplifications, you got this. There's the 3 fourteenths, the A. 3 fourteenths times R is 3 fourteenths times negative 5 fourteenths. You get a negative sign, 3 times 5 is 15. 14 squared is 196. We have the X minus 2 as well. Multiply that term by negative 5 fourteenths times x minus 2, you will get this. 15 times 5 is 75. 14 cubed evidently is 27.44. And you can continue. Big O just means there's higher order terms that are missing here. OK, so you should be able to algebraically uh, do that kind of trick to help you expand the series. That is good to get practice at that kind of thing. When I teach complex analysis for this particular year next spring, We'll be using that kind of trick sometimes in that course as well. Um, you should also be able to, well, first of all, know what the, the interval of convergence is. This converges when the absolute value of r is less than 1. So our series is going to converge when this is less than 1. Our common ratio is this. You can factor the negative 5 fourteenths out of the absolute value signs as a positive 5 fourteenths, then multiply both sides by 14 fifths to rewrite this inequality like this. And 14 fifths is 2.8. So the interval of convergence of this power series, which is a Taylor series for this function, centered at 2, 
uh, does not include the endpoints. The endpoints would be negative 0.8 and positive 4.8. It's the open interval from negative 0.8 to positive 4.8 as the interval of convergence. And the radius of convergence, capital R, is 2.8. Okay? You should know that. You should be able to confirm this radio, radius of convergence with the ratio test as well. Um, your generic term of the series here that we are adding, which we could call AK, is 3 fourteenths times negative 5 fourteenths times x minus 2 to the k power. So the limit that you would calculate from the ratio test would be this limit. And in this situation, what would that become? You do need the absolute value signs here because x could be less than 2. Um, ak plus 1 is going to be 3 fourteenths times negative 5 fourteenths to the k power. I can get rid of the negative sign here because I am taking absolute value signs here. Let me just go ahead and get rid of the negative sign. Just realize that the reason I'm doing it is because of the absolute value signs. We have a k plus 1 there. Don't get rid of the absolute value signs ultimately around the x minus 2, though I don't want to lay one there. This is still in the absolute values. x minus 2 to the k plus 1. And then dividing by a k is going to mean multiplying by its reciprocal. So we're going to get a 14 thirds. We're going to get a um, 14 fifths to the k power, which is the same as dividing by 5 fourteenths to the k power, so you will get some cancellation there. And we also get a, um, I guess, a 1 over x minus 2 to the k power. And we get some cancellation. The 3 there cancels with the 3 there, the 14 with the 14. This whole thing cancels with this whole thing, except with you need one factor of 5 fourteenths. This whole thing cancels with this whole thing, except for one factor of x minus 2. What's left over doesn't depend on k anymore. It's a constant in k. The limit is what's left over. The 5 fourteenths can be brought up front. Absolute value of x minus 2. And the ratio test says that if this is less than 1, you get convergence, which is going to give us the same answer. Not necessarily for the interval of convergence, but for the radius being 2.8. Um, the reason it doesn't give us the interval for sure is because the ratio test gives you no conclusion in the situation where this limit equals 1. You'd have to check the endpoints separately. However, this is a geometric series, and we know for geometric series you need a strict inequality here, so you definitely need a strict inequality here. We know for this series that you do not include the endpoints. Okay, so again, these are things you should be able to do. Come back over here. You should also be able to derive all of this with the generic Taylor series formula. The kth term being the kth derivative of f at c, where c is the center of your interval of convergence, center of your power series, which is 2 in this case. That's the kth derivative. Divided by k factorial times x minus c to the k. You should be able to use that as well. Um, it's not too much of a pain for this kind of problem. If you write your function as 3 times 4 plus 5x to the negative 1 power, then you can avoid the quotient rule with the derivatives. For example, f prime of x would be negative 3, 4 plus 5x to the negative 2, times 5, so you get a negative 15. F double prime of x, negative 15 times negative 2 is going to be positive 30. 4 plus 5x to the negative 3 times another 5, giving you 150. Divide by the corresponding factorials and plug in 2 as well into these things, and you should get the same answer as what you see here. You should check out on your own. Okay? So that's something you should be able to do for exam 3 as well. What else? Well, what about proofs? 
Um, the big theorems in section chapter 7, especially section 7.2, that I want you to be able to use are, well, the Weierstrass M test is one of them. And the theorem that comes before the Weierstrass M test that does not have a name, it's in our book here, theorem 7.4 on page 249. It would be good for you to look at that theorem. Have your book open, page 249. The next page is the Weierstrass M test. Both of those theorems can be, uh, in many situations, used to prove uniform convergence of a series of functions, which is what we've got here. Um, let's come back over here. I call this AK, and in my calculations, I essentially treated X as constant. But we could call it, consistent with series notation in chapter 7, we could call it f sub k of x. And we're really considering a series of functions that looks like this as a series of functions. <clears throat> Note there's no x there, that's a series of functions. And it converges pointwise if and only if the corresponding, converges pointwise over some interval if and only if the corresponding series of numbers, where you put the x in here, converges for all x in the given interval. Um, it is geometric here, but it's also the Taylor series for this thing again centered at c equals zero. What I'd like to show is that this series, as a series of functions, does converge uniformly to the function defined by this formula, the original function here, on any closed subinterval of the interval of convergence. And the particular closed subinterval we're going to pick here is going to be 0 to 3. Um, so that would look about like this 0 is about here. and is about there. We're going to consider that particular closed subinterval from 0 to 3. We're going to show the, the series of functions converges uniformly to the function f defined by this formula on this closed subinterval. That closed subinterval is not special. Any closed subinterval of this particular open interval of convergence, we would get uniform convergence on it. But we're ultimately going to also see that we do not get uniform convergence on the entire open interval, the entire interval of convergence. That might sound bad, but the fact that we can get uniform convergence on any subinterval, any closed subinterval, is enough to ultimately guarantee we can take this series and, for example, differentiate term by term or integrate term by term to find new Taylor series for other functions. Um, let me use Mathematica now for the sake of keeping the calculations that I try to do is do them as fast as possible. These are things you should be able to do by hand. Um, but I will do uh, them on Mathematica to go as fast as possible. I think it would be a good exercise for you to do these by hand. So let's define functions fk of x. to be exactly what I had on the board over there. So that's 3 fourteenths times, um, let's see, let's use parentheses here. Negative 5 fourteenths x minus 2 all to the k power. So that's going to be my terms of my series for any fixed x. That's a series of numbers, and it does define a series of functions. And let's let s sub n of x be the nth partial sum. I think it will be good if we, um, as I showed you before, I believe in this class, it's good for the k equals zero term to have it sort of separated off so we can avoid 
trying to do zero to the zero power in Mathematica. So I'm going to do you an f of two here, that's the first term, plus where f is still the same function, by the way, three over four plus five x, plus a summation, k goes from one to n of f sub k of x. And Mathematica, for example, should be able to use the formula for a finite geometric series to simplify S ten of x, for example. Okay? We know the formula for a finite geometric series. It is in the book. Way back in chapter one of this book, which is what I'm using right now and maybe in the future. Back in chapter one, the formula for a finite geometric series is there somewhere. It's on the page. Oh, I'm not seeing it. Ah. I know it's in there. I think it's section 1.2, but I just missed it. There it is. Yeah, page 14. Uh, you take the first term, A, rather than more, this is a finite geometric series with, say, n terms. It's no longer equal to that. So I have an n minus 1 there. You can write it something like this. Okay, I'm about to erase this now. Ignore this. For a finite geometric sum with n terms in this form, the power of the r there is, is n is the number of terms. That's the way I always remember it. So you can use that here, again, with a equal to the 3 14 and r equal to negative 5 14 times x minus 2. Mathematica does this, I think. Oh, it's not doing it. Can it simplify it? Uh, mm, not in the way that I wanted it to. OK, so it's not doing such a hot job of that. It's not recognizing it as a geometric series for some reason, though it really should. Let me try one other thing quick here. Let me try plugging, copying and pasting this in here and replacing the FK with this thing and see if it recognizes it as a geometric series in that case. I'll go ahead and put a 10 up here. No, it's not. Okay. I think if I put something in for x, it will. Okay, it's simplified it as a fraction. Okay, this is a little disappointing, but I think we can live with it here. Well, maybe not. Maybe what I should do is redefine s based on the formula that's on the board. Um, maybe for sake of clarity, to keep the other S there, I'll call it something different. Maybe capital S. So capital F, S and little s are going to be the same thing here. But um, it's not obvious unless you know the formula for a finite geometric series. So I'm going to do A, 3 14 times 1 minus r, this thing here, to the, actually if I do it this way, I want it to be the n plus 1 power, because the number of terms in Sn is n plus 1. There's a zeroth term we're going to up to n, there's n plus 1 terms. Over 1 minus 3 fourteenths. Little Sn and, and big Sn should be the same thing. If we, for example, find little s 10 of 0, is it the same as big S 10 of 0? Hopefully it is. No, it's not. Ah, this is just not so good here. Um, a is 3 14. It's probably negative 5 14. What did I do wrong here? This is not good. I don't want to redo this video. Uh, maybe you see the problem and I don't. I did it by hand in class. It was a mess, but I got it to work out. A is 3 14. It's R is negative 5. Plus 1. I do not see what the problem is. Uh, which of these is closer to f of 0? The first one. 
So it looks like this one is working perhaps, and this one is not. Oh, I know the problem. Three fourths. No. Five twos, three fourteens. Uh, oh, yeah, no, I know the problem. Sorry. Three fourteens is not R. That's the problem. Now it should work. Okay, yeah, it's working. Okay. These are the same thing. How long did it take? About three minutes, maybe? All right. Um, go ahead and laugh at me. I'm laughing with you. Uh -huh. All right. Um, where were we going to go with this? I wanted to use those theorems to prove uniform convergence over the closed interval from 0 to 3. How do you use the virus Strauss M test? Let's use that one. That one's Really, the easier one to use, actually, the Weierstrass M test. What we want is we want an upper bound on f k of x over the whole interval on the absolute value of f k of x. Call it m k, such that the sum of the m k's k goes from, in this case, zero to infinity, converges. You want this bound to be true for all x in the interval that you're considering, which is going to be the closed interval from 0 to 3 here. Something wrong? OK. Can you find an upper bound uh, for this quantity on this interval? And can this, does this series converge? Um, the answer is you can. And the way to think about it is to go back up here and look at this formula. Think about its absolute value. We can get rid of that negative 5 14 The absolute value of this is going to be 3 14 times 5 14 to the k power times the absolute value of x minus 2 to the k power. That quantity on the interval from 0 to 3 is maximized when x is 0. On this interval, 0 is the furthest from 2. This is maximized when x is 0. And when x is 0, you get negative 2 to the k power, excuse me, absolute value negative 2 to the k power, which is 2 to the k power. This is going to be less than or equal to, because of that, 3 14 times uh, 10 14 or 5 7 to the k power on this interval. Say that again. This quantity is maximized on this interval when x is furthest away from 2 on that interval, which is when x is 0. 0 minus 2 is negative 2. Absolute value is negative 2 is positive 2. Positive 2 to the k times positive 5 to the k is positive 10 to the k. 10 sevenths is the same as 5 sevenths, so you get this. This can work for mk. And this series is geometric. With common ratio 5 sevenths, it does converge. Therefore, by the virus Strauss M test, this series does converge uniformly to the function defined by that formula on this closed interval from 0 to 3. Any other closed interval, you'd still get uniform convergence, but not only entire open interval, as we will see. The fact that we get uniform convergence on any closed interval, uh, subinterval, does mean, by theorems in section 7.3, that we can take this series and differentiate term by term and integrate term by term to find new Taylor series for new functions. For example, the integral of this is going to involve a natural log. What would it be? Maybe 3 fifths natural log of 4 plus 5x. You integrate the series term by term, you will get a new series for that function. That would be the Taylor series for that function centered at 2. The integral of convergence could expand by one or two points, the endpoints, when you integrate. And I believe it does probably expand by one of them with the natural log. With one of these endpoints, I'm not going to try to figure out which one offhand. Uh, you will get convergence because you can use the alternating series test. The ratio test still would not be enough to prove convergence. But the alternating series test would. would. Probably at the other endpoint, you do not get convergence. That's what typically happens with these examples. If you differentiate the series term by term, you get the 
series for the derivative of this centered at 2, which, you know, we calculated over here would be the series for that function right there, centered at 2, and that would converge on the same open interval. You can lose points, endpoints for convergence when you differentiate series. We don't have the endpoints to begin with, so we can't lose them. It would be the same interval of convergence, the same, same radius of convergence in both cases. And again, the virus jaws M test proves uniform convergence. What about the other theorem? Theorem 4. Point, what, what, or excuse me, 7.4 was it? Seven point four, where you also consider some M's. The book called these MNs defined to be the soup of these values. over the interval in question, though for our problem, when f of x is defined by that formula, the thing that's converging pointwise to f is not the fn's, but the sn's. So we want to consider this quantity, and we're going to get uniform convergence over the interval, if and only if, this, is, this one's an if and only if, whereas the Weierstrass M test is in one direction, you can only use the Weierstrass M test to prove uniform convergence of a series over an interval. With theorem 7.4, it's an if and only if. You're going to get uniform convergence of this sequence of functions to this function over some interval if and only if the sequence of numbers mn approaches zero. I'm not stating these theorems completely, you can look at them in the book. And that is if and only if. So you could also use this theorem to prove that a sequence or series does not converge uniformly over an interval, even if it converges pointwise. Um, to apply this to the given situation, again, you need to use SNs because those are the partial sums. We are doing a series here, and it's the partial sums that converges pointwise to the function f. But this expression that you take the soup of is kind of a nasty expression here. Um, let me use my capital SN to see how well it simplifies. Maybe not very much. Simplify capital SN of x minus the original function f of x. I'm avoiding absolute values at the moment. Does it simplify? Yeah, I guess maybe that's not too bad. Taking the absolute value of this thing over this interval from 0 to 3, and finding the soup, if it's a number, at least, actually we will, we will use this soup even if it's infinity, when we prove it does not converge uniformly over the entire open interval. Um, where am I? This is the interval. The absolute value of this quantity would be the quantity to take the soup of over the interval from 0 to 3. <clears throat> you could graph the absolute value of this as a function of x. Let me go ahead and do that for fixed n. Plot abs of this for a fixed n like n equals 10. Though I could make an animation as n changes if I wanted to. x goes from 0 to 3. I believe this function will be maximized at 0. The graph is highest at 0. It has a value of around 0 0.018 or so. It looks like 985. 0 0.185 or so at 0. And in fact, for any n, this quantity is going to be maximized at 0 on the interval from 0 to 3. So the corresponding mn can be taken to be the value of this thing at 0. This is true. I'm not proving that. But this is a continuous function. It will attain its maximum. Let me go ahead and try n in here and try zeros here. 
That absolute value would be mn. And um, does the series, or does that, excuse me, we don't have to do a series. Does that go to the zero as n goes to infinity? This is a negative exponent when n is positive. Seven fifths to a negative exponent does go to zero as n goes to infinity. This goes to zero. This does converge. Two converges to zero. Yeah, negative three fourths plus three fourths is zero. This does converge to zero as n goes to infinity. Therefore, we do, this is another way to prove uniform convergence for the series over the interval from zero to three. On the other hand, over the entire open interval, just checking something here. Yeah. Over the entire open interval, from negative 0.8 to 4.8, we do not get uniform convergence to f of x for the series, or the sequence of partial sums. The Weierstrass M test cannot be used to prove that because it, it can only be used to prove that a series converges uniformly over some interval, not that it, it cannot be used to prove a series does not converge uniformly over some interval. Let me be clear, the series does converge pointwise to this function over the entire open interval, just not uniformly. Once again, theorem 7.4 can be used because it is an if and only if. If this does not converge to zero, then this series, um, the sequence of partial sums does not converge uniformly to the f of x, even though it does converge pointwise. I claim that over the entire interval, i being the open interval from negative 0.8 to 4.8, that each of these mn's is infinity. And basically, you can see that by plotting it again for any n. I can't really do plot range all here, though I don't think mathematics is even blocking me, because there's going to be a vertical asymptote at x equals negative 0.8. That's what happens if you do plot range all. OK, let's not do plot range all. Although I guess I'm glad that happened, so you see it. You believe there's a vertical asymptote there at negative 0.8. Looks like there might be a vertical asymptote at positive 4.8 as well, though that doesn't seem like that should be the case. Let's try this. Okay, yeah, it's only going up a little bit over there. I didn't think there would be this because this function doesn't have a vertical asymptote there. This has got a vertical asymptote at negative 0.8. Um, so you can you can simplify the formula for this. I guess we already have. And think about it as a function of x over the entire interval. This function of x does have a vertical asymptote of negative 0.8, no matter what n is. So in essence, that means each mn is infinity if you consider the soup to, um, in the extended sense, to be allowed to be infinity. And definitely the mn's don't go to zero. So therefore, by theorem 7.4, we do not get uniform convergence of the series over the entire domain but over any closed subdomain, we would. Well, that took a long time. Um, I want to continue going here because I want to have general review. But this, the rest of the review is going to be very short. Okay, I'm just going to verbally say um, what to expect, what to know for exam three. Stuff so in chapter six. So that includes a bunch of tests. It includes the divergence test. Do the um, this is for a series, do the terms go to zero? If they don't go to zero, the series, the summation, will diverge. If they do go to zero, you need another test. Um, there's the, what? There's the comparison test. There's the limit comparison test. There's the ratio test. The alternating series test. I'm probably forgetting a test. Here, those are the most fundamental ones that come to mind offhand. Um, you should be able to use all those tests. Will I give you, for example, a comparison test problem that's maybe a little trickier than the one that I gave you in class before? Possibly. An example I thought of in class this morning was what if you're considering the series k goes from 2 to infinity? 1 over k squared minus 1, you, you 
this is the terms you're adding up, the AKs, what should you use for BK? You can't use 1 over K squared because AK would not be less than BK. However, it turns out you can use 2 over K squared, and it will be true that AK and BK are non-negative, and AK is less than BK for all K greater than or equal to 2, though that takes a little bit of proof. It's not too hard to prove, though uh, it might not be clear what steps to use at first. 1 over k squared minus 1 being less than or equal to 2 over k squared, not claiming this is true right away, would be equivalent, since k is bigger than or equal to 2, if you cross multiply to k squared, k squared being less than or equal to 2k squared minus 2, I cross multiply there. There are no negative numbers there because k is greater than or equal to 2, so the inequality stays the same direction. And that is equivalent to k squared itself being bigger than or equal to 2, if you rearrange a bit. And that's definitely true when k is greater than or equal to 2, so you could work backwards through this logic to say that that's true. And these are also definitely non-negative. So you could apply the comparison test there. Um, so maybe a problem of that level of difficulty could be a proof that shows up on the test. What else? You should be able to use the limit comparison test here in that kind of example as well. And you, you can use, well, first of all, there is also the fact that this is a constant multiple of a p-series if you consider the summation, which we know would converge because p-series converge when p is bigger than 1 and the p would be true here. You could use the limit comparison test even if you had a 1 there. So the limit comparison test is a little less tricky in that way. Um, you should be able to apply the ratio test and the root test for assuming the limits exist. I guess I did forget to mention the root test. We need to do the limb super limb inf. I am not ruling it out. If, if I decide now or in the future to include it, I'd probably let you know ahead of time. Um, and you should certainly be able to apply the alternating series test as well as the, the bound on the absolute value of the error in the alternating series test in using a partial sum to approximate the infinite sum. There's stuff about absolute convergence and non-absolute convergence. You should know those facts and know facts about rearrangements, though there won't be any proofs. Going back to chapter 5, fundamental theorem of calculus and the average value of a function over an interval and the mean value theorem for integrals should all be things you should be able to state completely on the test, as well as use. And a common use of the fundamental theorem of calculus is to find derivatives of things like this, where maybe instead of an x here, I put like an x cubed. And I should probably use a different letter for the variable, the integral here, integrated here, like a t or something. Oh, I forgot to do that in the class this morning. To differentiate this, you need the fundamental theorem of calculus and the chain rule. If this were just an x, the answer would be cosine of x squared, but it's an x cubed. You need to replace the x squared with x cubed, and then because of the chain rule, multiply times the derivative of x cubed. And that simplifies, of course, to 3x squared cosine of x to the sixth. And therefore, you might be asked, for example, to find the first positive critical point of this function that I'm circling in black. And that would be where the first positive value that makes this 0, which would be where x to the sixth would be what, pi over 2. You should know facts about trig functions for this test as well. Besides that, you should know trigonometric identities, cos squared plus sine squared equals 1 when the inputs are the same. You should know the cotangent of x is cosine of x divided by sine of x. The, the secant of x is 1 divided by cosine of x. If I said the cotangent right. You should know those facts for this test. Um, you should be able to prove the substitution formula where you change the limits of integration, when you do the substitution in our book here, it's theorem 5.19. Uh, 
page 181 of this edition of the book. And we did that in class, too, though it wasn't a full proof. I didn't write sentences. But we saw that we need the fundamental theorem of calculus. We need the chain rule. There's stuff with the hypotheses. You know, what can you get away with assuming about the functions f and g, Riemann integrability, differentiability, and that kind of thing. Probably I'd give you a little help with that if you have that proof on the test. You should be able to interpret the average, calculate the average value, interpret it geometrically and arithmetically. We did talk about that in the lectures. The mean value theorem, you should be, for integrals, you should be able to interpret geometrically and find the C that works and be able to prove it with the fundamental theorem of calculus. You don't need to know the generalized mean value theorem. I think that's a real quick summary of pretty much everything else. If I think of anything else, I'll, I'll let you know now or in the future. That's it.